Morning. Today we're having a look round St Leonard's or Burton St Leonard's to give it its proper name I suppose. James Burton decided to build himself a town. It was very much a financial thing. It was at the period in time when it became fashionable to come to the sea, take the sea air for your health and vitality, get out of the polluted cities, or at least for the, the wealthy. So, he bought a patch of ground, and he built St Leonard's. Although St Leonard's is much, much bigger. Nowadays, obviously, it's expanded. And with Hastings expanding as well, what was two separate towns now meet in the middle. They're all just one place. But this was his original idea and plan. I'll take you for a walk around just the highlights. There's, there's too much, too, just too much history. So I'll, I'll just pick out a few. This is Crown House. This was actually the very first house that was built in St. Leonard's. James Burton had this built for him to actually live in while the rest of the place was being constructed. Quite a strange way of doing it. He actually had the timber frame, the internals of it, built in London, shipped down here, erected, and then they did all the brickwork and that around the outside. But uh, yes, very first house. The town has grown substantially since them days. Nowadays, it's a private residence. But after James Burton had it, it, it went through lots of different things. It's been a club, um, it's been a pub. It's, it's got quite a history. But I say now it's back to one private residence. And I'll imagine it's quite nice inside. the Royal Victoria Hotel. Now this was his centerpiece of his new town. And I think the idea was to get the rich and famous to come and stay at this, for the time, very lavish hotel. And while they're here, they might get to like the area and buy one of his houses. There's no, uh, sign of it now but in Victorian times with them being a, a conservative lot if they wanted to go to the beach to uh, do a bit of swimming or a bit of paddling they obviously didn't want to come out the hotel in their swimming gear that would that would never be done so underneath the road here there's a tunnel so they could get changed in the hotel go underneath the road and if I spin you round the prom so it's quite a, quite a drop down the beach level they would have emerged on that lower prom and walked straight onto the beach not that it looks over inviting today it's uh, a bit cold and damp and not very nice calm though no wind so no waves right this is the Masonic Hall directly behind the hotel. Um, it is now, belongs to the Masons for their meeting places. But it was a separate building, um, a separate venue where they had events because it was, was part of the hotel at one time. And underneath the road where I'm actually standing, there's actually a tunnel between the hotel and here. So they could ferry drinks and hot food to and fro without coming outside. As far as I know, the tunnel still exists, but I think it's been bricked up in the center because of now, of course, there's two separate ownerships. Okay, this one is the South Lodge. Um, this was basically the entrance to the subscription gardens behind. It's uh, not quite as grand as it was they've lost some of it, but it's not in bad nick for his age. Let's wander through the arch and have a look into the gardens.
This is the subscription gardens. As you can see, the grand houses that were all part of the scheme up on the right hand side there. They would have been like that all around this at one time. The idea of the gardens was it was a recreational area just for the posh people. It was all fenced off and it would have been gated. You wouldn't be able to just walk in here. And you paid your yearly subscription and it gave you a key. And you could unlock the gate and come in and out whenever you liked. But of course, only the local rich people could afford a key. Right, here we have the clock tower, uh, which is now the clock house. It was originally just meant to be a clock for the area, but they got a bit carried away and it evolved into a house. And from the other side, it's actually three stories high. I'll go round the other side in a bit and uh, I'll take some photos from the other side. I've actually been in there. It is wonderful inside. Right, that's the back side of the clock house. I'm standing in the middle of the garden. So yeah, as you can see, Gothic style, three stories. As I say, it's wonderful inside. Very quirky. I'd love to live there. That's, that's right up my street, that's a weird place. Now this is the North Lodge, um, which is the northern edge of Burton's new town. You can think of it as like a toll cottage really. Um, this was the gateway into the town and also the road leading out of it, behind the camera now, behind me, um, was a toll road. Because the town was a completely new construction in the middle of nowhere with no access roads. So they had to build a toll road from here to join up with the original London to Hastings Road. So everyone had to pass through here. Um, James Burton built this in 1830. And it was family home uh, for his daughter. And then at a later date, uh, it was Henry Ryder Haggard, um, who wrote King Solomon's Mines, as well as other well-known stories. He lived here after that and it was actually open to, to traffic um, until sort of like the early 2000s. Um, I can remember driving through there many times. Um, but it got hit so many times by large vehicles trying to get through there that were slightly too tall. And in the end, they just took the decision, let's just close it. There's plenty of other roads. They don't have to go this way. So now it's a, it's a walkway only. I just thought I'd pop up here and uh, just video this house as a fairly good example of the dwellings in the area. And don't worry, I did knock on his door and ask first. Um, because the original town of St. Leonard's, as I say, was James Burton, who, who did most of the building. But his son was a famous architect. Um, Desmus Burton, who was involved with a lot of um, famous builds in London. Well, he, he sort of carried on the legacy through the 1850s and 1860s, and you started to get more elegant styles, as, of course, the styles of the time changed as well. Uh, so, yeah, you ended up with a lot of properties like this. But as you can imagine, 1850s, 150-odd years ago, you needed a lot of money if you wanted to come and lift the Burton lifestyle, shall I say. The only lower class people in the area were the servants, essentially. The Horse and Groom Pub. This was the very first pub in St. Leonard's. There's an awful lot more now. Uh, but this one was basically built originally when all the building was being done to keep the massive labour force happy so they had a watering hole. This is an area called Murgatoria. They tried to be posh and give it Latin names. Um, 
Mercatoria is basically marketplace. It's where all the little shops and services were for the posh town. We're only one street behind where all the big dwellings are, overlooking the park. But they, uh, they didn't want to clutter the area with little houses and shops and things, so they built it one road away to keep it looking posh. Um, from Mergatoria, down at the bottom there, is actually an area called Lavatoria or washing place. It's where all the all the washing washerwomen lived. So all the laundry of the area was done in Lavatoria. As more and more money came into the area, the houses just got bigger and more lavish. And you ended up with ones like this. This is one of several, uh, this is called, um, this area is the Highlands. Um, I think there's four, four Highland houses all together in this area, all the same sort of style. But as you can see, that's a fairly impressive house. Right, here we have the old Highlands Inn or Highlands Hotel. Uh, shame we've got scaffolding on the front there to the left, but never mind. It's an old place, it needs the maintenance. Very old old grand place but the interesting thing with this well at least for me is to the right there I don't know if you can see over the top of that camper van where's my finger there looks like a long wall it does go a hell of a long way let me pick the camera up off in that direction that's all part of it and it also comes back to the age of the place um, I don't know how much of a sneaky look I can have a look but uh, I'll go up there and see if I can show you what that's all about. Right, this is what's behind that long wall. Um, this is essentially a stable yard. And it is of the period, this place, that people visiting were coming by coaching horses. So this is where your own personal horse or coach or whatever would have been parked up. And there's accommodation, runs right around the top. I'm sure you can see it. Probably better if I move a little bit so you can see the bottom end there. Quick adjustment. Quick zoom. There. You see, it's all, it's all flats now. Um, but, I mean, your coach, coachman, footman, and whatever, he would have stayed in the accommodation above the stables when you stayed in the hotel, because you're posh. Right, so I've come up on the access bit at the top. A bit cheeky, I know, but there's no one about. So yeah, there's all the little accommodation, sort of cottages, which are now flats. And underneath, all the stabling, which is now used as garages, of course. Not quite sure how old this is, but it's pretty old. As you can see, some of the constructions got to quite ridiculous proportions. That is a bit of a monster. I think, as far as I can tell, it's actually three houses. You can see the green doorway to the left there. Um, and there's one just to the right you can see but yeah that's just three three dwellings pretty impressive and if you're wondering what put your finger in the right way this is when they put the railway through wait that car to go past that's it when they put the railway through because of the cliffs they had to do a lot of tunnelling um, we're directly over the top of the railway it runs underneath here and that was one of a, a series of vent chimneys to let the, uh, the smoke and whatever out from the steam trains which I bet was a bit weird if you was walking along here and suddenly puffs of smoke and steam come out of there but uh, yeah it's a chimney vent now being used as a roundabout right 
Now, first off, I apologise for the traffic noise, but we are right on the seafront on the A259, so it does get a bit busy. Although today I've concentrated on the Burton sort of older area, I couldn't really be down in this area without talking about Marine Court or the Marina Building, as us locals call it. It's unusual, let's say that. The whole idea was it was designed to look like the ocean liner, the Queen Mary, that had been launched same sort of period and they want to capitalise on all the publicity so they built it to look like a boat and they haven't done bad in my estimation there is so many facts and figures about this I've written them down and I'm just going to rattle through them really quick started in 1936 finished in 38 500,000 to build it, which was a fortune at the time, way over budget. They had 500 men working on it constantly. In its construction, which was one of the very first to use steel and concrete, like the modern skyscrapers, so it's quite a new idea, probably why it cost so much as well. When they built the building, they used 200 tonnes of cement. No, that wasn't 200. I can't read my own writing. 2,000 tonnes of cement. 2,500 tonnes of sand. One and a half million bricks. There's 22,000 square feet of glass. 14,000 tonnes of ballast. 2,100 tonnes of steel. And 3,000 gallons of paint. And if you go inside... Well, it's a bit weird inside because although people owned individual little units in there, almost like bedsits, they, most of them didn't have kitchens because the place had its own dining rooms, ballrooms and so on. It, it operated more like a hotel where you actually bought your room. Obviously now... Uh, people actually live there full time. Most of the places are what was one or two rooms that have been knocked through to make it big enough to be a dwelling. So it's very funny shapes in there. The room numbers are all over the place. But inside, the six acres of partitions, seven miles of skirting boards, five and a half acres of floor space, 14 acres of plaster on the ceilings and walls and there's 2,000 doors. The only other thing... <coughs> excuse me. The only other thing that's probably worth mentioning, in the 60s, there was actually a club here um, underneath it called the Cobweb. Not famous at all. Only locally. No one else really knew about it. But they did have the likes of Jimi Hendrix, David Bowie, a lot of top stars of the time actually came and played at the Cobweb. So there's a fair bit of history within that building. Oh, one other point. When it was built in the 30s, it was officially the highest dwelling place in England. There was no other block of flats at the time, not even in London. So it did hold the record for the highest dwelling place in England at the time. Now this seems an appropriate place to finish. The Burton family tomb. You used to better go in there and go right up to it. But I don't know quite how well you'll see. That's the edge of the cliff. There's been so much cliff erosion. Um, they've fenced it off now. I'm actually standing on a wall <laughs> so I could film this it's as close as I can get. But yeah, that was the family tomb. Top of the cliff. Overlooking his beloved town. I'll go that way. That's, that's the end of the Victoria Hotel. Right, that concludes my walk around Burton St. Leonard's. Or at least the highlights, shall we say. 
Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. It's something I enjoy doing. I do like a bit of local history. Um, one thing I've noticed more and more, because I've actually been walking around, photographing and so on, the amount of houses, I don't know if you can see on that one, above the window, 1832. So much of it was built in that first year that probably 50% of the houses here in this immediate area have got 1832 on them because most of the building was 32 to 34. Thanks for watching guys. I'll see you on the next one.